This video is a guide to getting a 9 in GCSE English language. If you look at the length of this video, I think there isn't a video on YouTube that explains in such detail on how you improve in the subject of GCSE English language like this one does. Personally, over the last two weeks, I've poured my absolute best and all into making this video. I've A, gone and read books such as The Magic of Thinking Big, which I do have here. It's a sick book, by the way, and um, if you want to know more about mindset, you should go read it. I've also read books like Atomic Habits and Psycho-Cybernetics, which I've tried to get the key ideas from and develop the correct mindset for getting a 9 in GCSE English language. I've also spoken to GCSE English teachers and tutors and written down their notes on what they say is the best way to prepare for English language. I've also asked other students who've gotten a nine in English language and taken advice from them as well. I've also recounted my own story, by the way. I've, I, if you don't know who I am, I am a student who's just finished their GCSEs and I have gotten a grade nine in my GCSEs. I think my story is also very valuable to you as the viewer because I've gone from achieving fours and fives in English to now consistently over the last two mocks or one mock, I've gotten the highest in my class and gotten a nine. And all of that information is condensed and distilled into a step-by-step -step framework in the form of this video. So the best way you can learn from this video, in my opinion, is just give me your full uninterrupted focus for the rest of the length of this video. Honestly, if you can just turn on full screen and perhaps get a piece of paper or a notepad and a pen, and just note down the key points from this video, I guarantee you, if you apply these notes, you will get a grade nine, or you will have a very, very, very good chance of getting a grade nine at GCSE. With all of that said, and the intro of this video done, I hope you gain from this guide, and I hope you eventually achieve your goal of getting grade nine in GCSE English language. It was a cold November morning of 2021. I was outside my English classroom in fear. My hands were all clammy and I was sweating buckets. I stank. But I was doing this for a specific reason. And that reason was that on that day, on that Monday morning, I was getting my English language mock back. And honestly, the night before the test, I had binge watched all of this GCSE English content. I had gone and watched all of Mr. Salas's videos, all of Mr. Everything English's videos on English language and a plethora of English language content. So I went inside my classroom and asked my teacher for my test. And when I took my test back, I looked in disappointment at the five that was etched on my test. How could this happen? I spent hours preparing for English language. How have I gotten a five? And it wasn't just a strong five, by the way. I was one mark above the grade boundary for the five. I was shocked. I had got one of the lowest in my entire class, but probably revised the most. I looked at my other friend, let's call him Brian, and he had gotten a nine in his GCSE English language. I snatched away his papers by force. <laughs> no, 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 not by force. I'm not inciting violence. But I snatched away his paper and I looked at his answers and I looked at the quality of the answer he had given. I went up to him and said, Brian, how, how have you written such a good response and his response to this question changed my entire life no no not my entire life it changed my perspective to english language he said i don't know i just thought of it that way now you may not think much about this response that he gave but this really resonated with me i thought to myself was i was i not enough why couldn't i think of this response why couldn't i respond to the questions the same way as my friend had done. And this video will help you with exactly that. In this video, I'm gonna teach you exactly how top grade students think of their responses, how they interpret sources. And I'm gonna give you a four step framework where you can use with any subject, I'm using with A-level currently, called ILPI, Identity, Learning Content, Practicing, and Intentional Improvement, that helps you garner all of the skills you need to get a grade nine in your GCSE English skills. Honestly, I wished, I wished, I longed that someone had made the same kind of video when I was a kid in year 10, trying to get a grade nine in English language and not disappoint my parents. I promise you that if you follow through on this framework, you will get a grade nine. And if not, if by any chance you don't get a grade nine, you come very, very close. 
See, the thing is, many people think they're not an English student and they just give up. But I'm here to tell you that if you can read basic English, if you can read sentences, this guide is for you. This guide is for anyone who can literally read. And I believe that they are possible candidates of getting a grade nine. So if you just follow this four step framework, I'm just going to lay out in this in this guide, you're going to get a grade nine. Also, another thing before I jump into my four step framework of getting a grade nine at GCSE, this video is specifically, not specifically, but like tailored to the AQA exam board. So I'm going to be referencing question three, which is the structure question, question two of paper one, which is the language question, which is all AQA terminology. But I do believe that if you use my framework, you're going to, it's going to apply to every single exam board. So don't worry if you're not an AQA student, just watch this video and learn from this video, but don't take like specific advice. For example, don't take the question by question advice, just take the overall general protocols that I give you in this video. Imagine you take two students, student A and student B, and you place them in a room together and you lock the room. Student A has recently got 85% in his recent maths mock. I know this is an English video, but just stay with the analogy. Imagine he got 85% in his recent maths mock and you sit him down on a desk and then you get student B and you put him next to him and he has got 20% out of 100 in his recent maths mock. Now imagine you teach both of these students a new concept in maths, specifically maths, and you're saying, okay, after three days, I'm going to test you both on this topic. This topic is completely foreign to them. For example, let's say completing the square. You teach them that new topic. Which student do you reckon is going to get more on the end of topic test? Student A, right? Now ask yourself, why? Why student A? If the topic was completely foreign and both students have never seen the topic before and have never really experienced the topic, why would student A get more than student B in the end of topic test? The answer here lies in identity. It doesn't come from some inheritance or genetic thing in student A that's programmed his mind to be better at maths. It's simply their identity they hold for themselves. In the book Atomic Habits and in the book Psycho-Cybernetics, which is written by really smart people, Max Wellmont and this guy named James Clear, they say that the way you see yourself or the way you perceive yourself really determines the actions and the habits you perform. See, the thing is, if you see yourself as someone who's good at a subject, for example, maths, you're way more likely to perform better in the subject than if you just see yourself as struggling with the subject. I think this is a problem that I've struggled with a lot. I always saw myself as not being good at English. I always saw myself as having the downside or not having the upper hand because I, I was brown skinned and I come from India. But this isn't the way you should see subjects or English in general. If you just see yourself as a better English student or if you see yourself as a sick English student, the neurons or synapses in your brain, I'm, I'm not going to get into details with this, but you're way more likely to perform better in that circumstance, in that subject of English. See, you probably know that there's a particular subsection of students in your class around the world that are somehow really good at studying, but you don't really know why. You, they're like the weird niques that don't really study, but they're sick of the subject. This isn't because of genetics or inheritance or because their mom and dad were like computer scientists or really good at studying. It's simply because they see themselves as being good at the subject. This is the same with things like weight loss or quitting something like smoking. If you see yourself as having quitted smoking, you're much more likely to stop smoking than if you see yourself as someone who is trying to stop smoking. See, I had learned this in the beginning of year 11 and what I'd done after this completely changed my English grade for the better. What I said was, okay, if the best case scenario in my mindset was that if I see myself as a sick English student, I'm way more likely to succeed I just started deluding myself, constantly saying in my brain that I'm sick at English. There's no one in the planet who can get better at English language than me. My interpretations and responses to questions are sick. No one in my class is better than me at English. I completely deluded myself, kept on saying in my brain that I'm sick at English, I'm sick at English. And before tests, I would visualize myself writing the perfect 10 out of 10 amazing response to every single question. Eventually that started to happen. Eventually, I don't know if this is some kind of weird law of attraction stuff, but this is pretty real in my life that as soon as I change my identity as being good at English, 
my brain just started to rock it up. If you're just going to see one section in this guide and not really going to apply anything, this is the section that I would go into the most depth depth into. Depth, depth into. <laughs> you won't believe me that I got an, in grade 9 in English language. Depth into. Because the thing about identity is it works in all aspects of life. And if you can really see yourself as a sick English student and literally just delude yourself into saying, oh yeah, I'm, I'm really good at English. I know this is maybe sounding a bit cringe to everyone else if I say it out loud, but if I just say it in my brain, I'm sick of English, I'm sick of English. There's no one in my class that, that I can't be in English. I, I am incredible at English language. You're gonna see results. You're gonna see better responses form in your brain, better responses to questions that you previously thought were hard. So I encourage you, I demand that for your English language grade to grow up, you need to see yourself as an incredible English language student that perhaps may have found some stuff hard, but you need to see yourself as being good at English. I hate the defeatist mindset that some people hold, where they're like, oh no, English isn't for me, English isn't my type of subject. That's, that's what's causing you to be bad at English. Your mindset is causing you to get bad grades. I, I don't know how, like, if I was seeing my younger self, I would literally slap him around the face and say, no, you're sick at English. You're not going to get bad results just because you're brown skinned or you speak a different language at home. You can get sick results at English language if you just see yourself as being incredible at English language. So this is the first step of the framework for any subject. See yourself as being good at the subject. Summary of the previous section. In order to get a grade nine in English language, you need to see yourself as someone who's good at GCSE English language. To do this, you need to brainwash your brain or delude your brain into saying thoughts or manually inserting thoughts into your brain saying that you're good at English. Literally just say, uh, close your eyes for like five, 10 seconds and say to yourself, I'm really good at English language. I'm gonna get grade nine in my GCSEs. I truly believe that there's no one capable of writing the quality of response that I have written. Even if you're getting twos, threes, fours in English language, this will eventually help you to progress in the future. So that's just a summary of the identity guide. Let's move on to the next step of the framework, which is learning new content. This is the second fundamental step that you need in order to gain success in any subject, in any exam board. Learning new content is usually in subjects like sciences or maths, a big section that you need to do. But a good thing about English language is that there's not that much content that you need to learn in order to get a grade nine. It all depends on the structure and the response that you use for the question that gets you the grade nine. And I will be co covering that later on in the video. For this section, however, I really want to minimize the amount of content that students learn. Honestly, I'm just gonna link down two videos by this guy named Mr. Everything, which is really good. And he literally teaches you all of the content you need for English language. <laughs> we spend hours and hours in English lessons, in English lessons in school, but the only real things you need to learn in English language is what to do in each question for the papers, language techniques and structural techniques. And genuinely, I don't think that there's any more than that. I don't think that there's any more than, let's say two hours of content that you need to know for English language. So if you are a complete noob, <laughs> newbie to GCSE English language and you've gotten like use or ones and you don't think you, that you understand the content, such as metaphors and similes, I would recommend you go watch those videos. If not, I really think you should move on to the next section because learning content in GCSE language, I think people overdo it. I've seen so many people use overcomplicated words like zoomorphism or aneurysm or one of the isms that don't really make sense. And I, I just look at them, why? You don't need to do that. All you need to know is like metaphors, similes, and you can get the grade nine. I think if you're really, really passionate about GCSE English language, then you can go watch these big, big ass videos on zoomorphism and past prefect particles on English language. but. Let's be honest, if you're watching a guide like this, you're probably not passionate about the subject and you just want to get the grade nine with not really that many strings attached. So just watch those two videos and that's really this section. I know this is a short section, but that's all the content you really need to learn for GCSE English language. This brings me on to the next fundamental, probably the most important part of this guide, which is practicing content. Practice. Practice is the single 
most highest leverage that you could do to increase your English grade. And what that means is, if you were to filter out all of the stuff said in this guide, the only thing you would really need to guarantee you the most results is practicing correctly. In the next few sections, I'm gonna tell you exactly how to practice and improve your paragraph structure or your responses to questions to guarantee yourself a grade nine. There is a lot of varied information online on how to respond to questions on English language. There is the pretzel structure, there is the petal structure, peel, P-E-I, P, so many structures that effectively say the same thing. In, the, in this section, I'm going to tell you exactly how to write the perfect paragraph and what structure would guarantee you the most marks. If you really think about it, the response to a question is actually very subjective because when you see a lot of top grade students, they all don't use the same paragraphing structure. Some of them use petal, some of them use peel, and it's really varied. So that tells you that the type of structure you use doesn't really have an effect on the grade you get in English language. When I actually went into it and I looked around and I looked at the mark schemes, there's mainly only two things you need to include in your paragraphs for them to be very top grade and guarantee yourself a grade nine. Before I do go into this, I wanna say that this paragraphing structure only applies really to questions two, three, and four in the AQA board. And question five, I'll come on to later. And question one is, question one is pretty easy. Like if you're, <laughs> if you're failing question one, <laughs> then <laughs> there's no hope for you. I, I mean, there is, but like, come on, you can't be failing question one. So effectively, there is A, the interpretation of the source in your response, i.e. the quality of your response and the justification of your interpretation. I know what I may have said may not make sense right now, but effectively what that means is in your responses to guarantee yourself a grade nine or the top grades, you need to have a sick and absolutely incredible interpretation of the response, sorry, the source. And what this means is you should interpret the source like other students don't. The second point means that you should take this interpretation of the source and link it back to your point in such a way that it makes for a very effective response structure. So for example, if I have a description and I come up with a sick interpretation, but I can't link it back, you're only really capped at a certain amount of marks. So I think to really improve in your paragraphing structures and to improve in your responses, you need to improve in these two main sections. I do say main sections because there's other ways to lose marks as well. There's other ways to improve your grade as well. For example, if you get the terminology wrong, you're effectively going to lose marks. If you say that the word ran is a metaphor instead of a verb, then you're going to lose, you're going to lose marks. But I say this as the majority. So the majority of marks is gained through the interpretation of your source and the linking back to the initial point. So here comes the meat of the video. The perfect structure or the perfect paragraphing structure that I use throughout my GCSEs to get myself two grade nines in both Englishes is similar to pretzel and it includes this. First, you make a point about the source. This point is very basic. For example, the boy did this or the writer shows this. Then you provide a simple interpretation of the text. For example, let's take my other point. The boy said this, or the writer shows that this, then you would take a simple or ger generic vague interpretation of the text and you would put it in your answer. In this point, you would use terminology here. So the second section is where you use terminology. I know that this may be sounding weird because I'm explaining you in front of a camera, but I'll, I'll get my responses out in a second and you can see this in practice. After this, however, then this is where you get an in-depth interpretation of the text. And how do you do this? How do you provide, how do you get yourself an in-depth interpretation of the text that like not other students will think about? Well, it's actually kind of simple. What you need to do is basically zoom into certain words or like basically write about the first thing you think about or the first theme you think about when you get your evidence. For example, if you have words that are very grim and glum in descriptiveness, a normie who's writing the English exam would maybe comment on how glum or how solemn the mood is in that period of time. But what we're gonna do is, what's the first thing we think about when we think about black, all right? We could, we could, we could talk about uh, it being a very solemn mood. It could be frightening mood. However, black is also associated with a lack of morality. 
So now, after you have that in-depth interpretation that not many other students are going to think of, what you do then is try your best to justify it and link it back to your point. Now, the best way to do this or the best way to practice this is literally to go as far-fetched as possible in your interpretations. Literally think of the most far-fetched themes to support your evidence and try your hardest to link it back. What this means is if you provide some random, like weird ass interpretations of the description, the worst thing that could happen is you may lose marks on, maybe you didn't link it back to your point as well, but at least you're not writing the same as everyone else's. So this is effectively the paragraphing structure I use. So there's point, basic interpretation, in-depth interpretation and link back. P-E-I-L, basically. That, that, that's, my, that's my one, but I just think that this structure that I just said provides both an opportunity for you to increase your grade on the interpretations you use and the linking back to your point that you use. Now I'm gonna switch onto my laptop here and show you some examples because I know that this may sound like really weird when I'm speaking in front of the camera, but hopefully when you look at my laptop, it's gonna look a bit better and it's gonna be a bit easier. Okay, here I'm in a different camera angle and hopefully you can see my screen correctly right now. Um, effectively, if you didn't get what I was talking about in, um, sorry, the camera shaking. If, if you didn't get what I was talking about when it, kind of, it came to um, structure of my uh, response, it's here on the screen. So effectively, what you want to do is make a point about the text, provide a basic interpretation or something generic that every other student would say, and then try your hardest to find that perceptive, perceptive, in-depth interpretation of, of the text. And the easiest way that I said to do this was literally to write about the most outrageous thing you can think about in your hand, uh, head or like try your hardest to make it far as far-fetched as possible and then all you have to do then is just try your hardest to link it back to the initial point and here you can see on, on the screen that uh provide a table of examples i'm going to put a table of examples on screen of common examples of perceptive responses that i thought of when i was writing mine so there were certain like letters I saw that I would always write this one thing. So for example, if I saw a repetition of the letter B or the letter P, P, not P, P, um, P, then I would always say that these are plosive letters. And what this connotes is some kind of brutalness or violence, even if it wasn't like a violent text. For example, if it was like a, lo a love text and there was loads and loads of P's and B's, all I would say then was like the love is somehow violent, which foreshadows something. And I would try my hardest to link it back to my initial point. So if you kind of get that structure, let's go on to move on, uh, moving on to, um, sorry, let's moving on to, let's go on to my actual response. So you can see how I implemented that. So here you can see, I think it's the 2019 paper. I don't actually use a certain amount of paragraph. Uh, sorry, this, this section is, uh, um, upside down, but I don't use a certain number of paragraphs. I'll say this later on this vi in the video, but I don't use a certain number of uh, paragraphs because I don't want to cap myself at a certain amount. So here it says, read my first paragraph, the writer highlights how the moment was clear and as pure as ice. That is my point. That's my first initial point that I'm going to try and justify later on in the video, in the, not the video, the response. The use of the simony highlights Zoe's intention to go skiing and highlights how she is in a serene and tranquil in demeanor, not in, in demeanor. Again, this is a generic, this is my generic statement. Here, pure as ice, I just thought of, okay, pure as in pure and ice have like calm connotations. Everyone's gonna be saying that Zoe is calm in this moment in time. And I just I just stated the terminology, which is simile. This is very this step. Don't overlook this step. This step is very important in getting you you the grade. You the use of your terminology in the generic response will get you good grades. So this is my part. The use of the simile highlights is always intention to go skiing. However, I then go on to provide a more in depth response. So here I say something like Zoe highlights how the mountain breathed back at her. It's a repetition of bees. And if you listen to what I said previously in the video, I'm gonna link this to violence because bees are plosive letters. I'm also gonna provide some weird ass, outrageous um, interpretation of the source that I'm gonna try justify later on. So here, the use of the personification highlights how Zoe resonates and connects with the surrounding environment. 
Here I'm thinking, okay, breathe. What what else breathe? Animals breathe. Humans breathe. What, what, does, what does this somehow signify? Okay, this may signify that Zoe is in touch with her surrounding environments because she feels like even the big mountain, which is like really stationary, even that's breathing back at her. So I provided some, uh, some explanation. On an emotional level, however, the use of ice is has cold and un, uncomfortable connotations. Okay, this is another, I think I go into another um, like in-depth interpretation. So I, I, I was like, okay, ice, icy is like an adjective that describes a person. So what could ice connote? Cold. So this could sense that Zoe has a slight tinge of dread in her because she feels that although that she's resonating with the environment, the ice around her is very cold. So uh, it's, it's kind of contrasting. I, I know like you may be thinking, oh, how has he come up with this? Literally, this is the first thing I thought of. And I just wrote as much as I could trying to justify my initial point. Um, again, I say the use of the repetition of the plosive le letter B, breathe back, creates a violent and aggressive sound, which may symbolize Zoe's underlying, uh, underlying discomfort whilst about to ski. This is a perfect paragraph. And I think I got eight out of eight on this response. This has all, all the, this ticks all the points in my structure. And I think that if you have these pre-planned things you're going to write about, for example, me, as soon as I see P and B, I always write about aggressiveness or violence. And if you have that, and if you copy my table, and if you literally just write about the first thing you think about, and then just try and make it far-fetched, try your hardest to make your interpretation sound far-fetched. And this is, and then link it, of course, to the point of the question. And this is how you get good grades in English language. This is the key to how you improve. So hopefully you like my little presentation. Hopefully you like the camera angle. It's actually the next day from filming the video. I was really tired after. I'm gonna link my entire response. You can, you can read my next paragraph on the screen. I have I, I won't read it out again, but I will link this entire PDF document in the uh, YouTube video uh, show no, no, uh, description down below, so you can see it. But effectively, that's basically the paragraph structure that you need to employ. Again, this structure is slightly different for um, the question three AQA question. So if you're not an AQA student, this this structure should should be your go-to structure, unless your teacher tells you otherwise, which, which they shouldn't. So if you're using like a st structure your teacher gives you, you sh this, your structure or your writing should have all of the elements in this um, paragraph, uh, paragraph structure that I'm providing you. I think these four things make a point, make a basic interpretation, then providing an in-depth interpretation and linking that back to the point will guarantee you the grade nine. But if you're studying uh, AQA, question three is uh, like, commonly known as the hardest question because it's structure there's no language however the, the the paragraph is kind of the same you make a point but instead of having a basic interpretation of the text you now go on straight to make the in-depth interpretation now the good thing about this is question three can all be pre-planned beforehand you can literally have things that you look out for and write every single time in every single response when writing question three so effectively, the, the paragraph structure you want to use in question three is make a point, provide an in-depth interpretation of the, um, I don't know why I'm saying um a lot, of the, the source or the evidence, and then you justify why this is relevant and why the writer included this, and then you link it back to the initial point. So if you want to see my structure question, it's here as well. <coughs> oh, I saw that down there. Please excuse the technical difficulties. Um, okay, okay. The writer initially fo uh, focuses the reader's attention on the weather of the surrounding. The short sentence, it was snowing in. Again, I'll provide a table on, on screen that shows you like the stuff that you can copy from me that I wrote every single time I saw a question three. Or every, time, every single time I saw a short sentence, I would say either it's for impact, and I would say, okay, the writer included this for impact, or I would say it makes a break point in the tempo of the pair, of the extract, which gives this sentence more attention. So here I say, the writer empl employs the short sentence, it was snowing again. The use of the short sentence emphasizes the importance of nature. Again, this is all pre-planned. I, I already know, I knew that if I see a short sentence, I would talk about how the writer has included it for importance. 
But this is something you can do in your practice or just take it off me if you want to. Again, I'm not going to read out the entire paragraph and explain it to you. If you want to look at this, it's on the description down below. But hopefully now you get an understanding of how you use my structure or like any structure you use that has all four elements to write a response. If you're like a grade one, two, three or four, five, maybe even six, seven, eight, you may be looking at this and thinking, OK, um, how would I do this? Keep consistent. Trust me. I don't, so many people ask me uh, ask me this. Are you good at English naturally? No, bro. I, I I didn't know how to answer this at first. Like I was I wasn't even finishing the question in my English language. But just practice this, and I think I explained this later on in the guide. It's really weird how I filmed this. So I filmed this after um, I filmed my video. So I don't know exactly where this section is going to come in the video. But uh, effectively, just keep consistent, and you'll see results. That's me. You, you should find this in the description down below and let's go on to the next section. Now, after seeing my responses to English language questions in the past, I know that a particular section of people are going to feel overwhelmed and scared at the quality of response that I displayed. And this is exactly the feeling that I went through when I was looking at English language videos in the past. I would look at amazing responses written by these people who are neeks, who read books all the time, who have practiced so much. And I would be like, how the hell do they write the quality of responses <laughs> like that? How, how, how are they thinking of that? But I promise you that if you just practice, literally just do four, five, six full past papers, you're going to get to that level. You're going to get to the level where you're going to look at your own writing. You're going to look at your own interpretations and justifications. And you're just going to be like, what the hell? How have I come up with that? And that's effectively how I, I felt. I'm, I'm not some English genius. I literally just practiced and I came to this level. Just implement the advice I've given in this video, implement the structure I've given in this video, and just practice. Just get your head down and practice. I can only tell you how to do stuff. I can't actually practice for you, and that's your job. Don't be like one of those people who just binge watch these videos and then skip on to the next one. Actually practice English language, practice what I've given you, and you're gonna see a drastic, trust me, I guarantee it, a drastic change in your English language grade. So this is just a, a subsection. Don't get too overwhelmed at my responses and just keep grinding. Also, before I go into the next video, I just want to recommend this one guy who I'm going to link down below. His name is Mr. Sales, teaches English or Mr. Sales teach English. I don't even know how to pronounce his name. He's this guy, he's this bald guy on YouTube and he makes like really good English videos. I used to binge watch all of his videos, but I never used to take action. And I'm gonna link a playlist down below where he explains exactly how to get full marks in every single question in English language, uh, the AQA GCSE board. And if you are looking into exactly what you need to do to get 100% in each response, then I would recommend this video, these videos to him. I think my, my paragraph structure is good, but it's a little bit vague. So if you want exactly what to do for every single question, go watch the videos down below. This then brings me on to the next section, which is quantity over quality. I've seen a lot of people online and in person asking the teachers a really cringe question. They raise their hand up, they look the teachers in the eyes, and then they ask them, how many paragraphs should I write for every question? I'll tell you why it's a cringe question. And it's because they don't understand that in English language, especially GCSE, it's all about the quantity and not the quality. I know there is an element of quality, like if you do need a very high quality response, but if you cap yourself at a certain number of paragraphs per question, you're effectively limiting the quality of your response as well. So my advice for this and the advice that I took by, I can't remember who, but someone gave me this amazing piece of advice. I think it was this guy named Mr. Salad, who I linked below. And he was just like, write as much as you can in English language. Like, don't cap yourself. Just write as many paragraphs in the structure that I've given to you. And literally just write until your hand hurts. If you walk out of an English exam and your hand doesn't feel like it's going to fall off, you, you've done it wrong. So that, that's... I can go into more depth into why it's quantity over quality. But effectively, in order to form high quality responses and high quality interpretations, and just to think better... You need to keep on constantly be writing in the English exam. And you shouldn't be like that one student you just see laying back in his desk, legs on legs, and then just sipping water. Don't, don't drink water in the English exam. Just write until your hand like falls off. 
You don't have time to be drinking water. Just write until your hand falls off. I think English language is the most time pressured s subject that I did personally. And it's literally, if you take any breaks, you've done it wrong. You should completely focus the entire one hour, 45 minutes, I think is, to just writing. Don't take any water breaks, just write. So <laughs> after this little rant, that's, that's the end of this section. This brings me on to the next section, which is use chat GPT to destroy your competition. In 2016, an application came out that completely changed the way we view society today. This application is TikTok, and this has nothing to do with the English language video. I just wanted to say that it's had a massive impact on society. And the application that is useful to this video is an app or a AI chatbot called ChatGPT. See, ChatGPT is very, very useful. And in the context of English language, it's incredibly useful. However, people our age use it for random shit, like searching out, <laughs> searching out the recipe for crystal meth or whatever the other crazy stuff they do. But what we're going to use it is to effectively destroy our competition in English language and secure that grade nine. To do this, we need to replace our teachers in marking, not, not in person, of course. Now, what we need to do to use ChatGPT is to either write our response or type up our response. I prefer typing up my response and then using ChatGPT to mark our individual English language questions. See, the good thing about ChatGPT is it's very malleable. And what this means is it can act like a teacher and especially a GCSE English teacher. Now, if we copy the mark schemes and the questions and put them into ChatGPT, this literally just replaces our teacher. Not exactly, I, I, don't, I don't have anything against teachers. I'm just saying that if you want to make your marking a lot more effective and you want to do a lot more practice, then just typing up the question, for example, just type up the question in the English language test and then print the mark scheme and then do mark my, mark my response, I think it was. Now, you can even use ChatGPT to pinpoint exactly where you need to improve. For example, if I'm writing a question to response and it gives me, let's say six out of eight, I can ask it where I need to improve and like what, pinpoint exactly where I can improve. And also I can use it to rewrite my answer to give it eight out of eight. Now, a disclaimer in this is that ChatGPT is not 100% accurate. And of course there are some fluctuations and you should be marking from a teacher as well. But let's be honest, ChatGPT is pretty accurate. And if you have that resource online, there's no reason why you shouldn't be using it to mark your, mark your work on English. Now, what I've done is for the AQA GCSE English Language Board specifically, I've created prompts on ChatGPT. So you don't need to like type up the question and type up all the mark schemes. I have created preset templates or prompts where you can just copy into ChatGPT and then just copy in your answer. And then it just gives you the mark out of the mark the question was out of and it gives you some feedback if you ask it to. So yeah, this is just a small section on why I think or I believe that ChatGPT, if you use it correctly, you can destroy your comp competition, comp competition, if you use it correctly, that is. This brings me on to the last step of the entire framework, intentional improvement. Hopefully now you understand that to get the nine in GCSE English language, it's not as hard as people see it. You just need to use the perfect paragraph structure, practice that over and over again, and just mark it and get a constant feedback loop into where you need to improve. You, you can do this through ChatGPT or your teachers. This brings me on to the, probably the second most important or the third most important part of this entire guide, which is intentional improvement. This section is essentially where you pinpoint exactly where you need to improve in English language and you just boost that. And that effectively brings your entire grade up. Now, this part of the framework is much more effective for other subjects such as science. But for English, the markings are a bit vague and you kind of know that to, in order to increase your grade, you need to increase the quality of interpretations you're doing and the linking back or the justification to, to the point you're doing. So a quick li a little checklist, a simplified one, on why you're not getting the grades you are right now is A, you haven't written enough. There's not enough quantity in your answer. B, your interpretations aren't sophisticated or far-fetched enough. You're writing exactly what every other student's writing. Or C, you haven't linked back to the point or you haven't justified your interpretations as good enough. Now, all of these, every single one of these can be solved through the use of practice papers. If you just do, let's say, seven, seven practice papers, 
Maximum seven practice papers, I guarantee you'll get a nine. If you constantly, every single practice paper you do, or every single, or one of the seven, and every single practice paper you do, you get it marked either by a teacher or by ChatGPT, you write down where you can improve, and then you do the same next practice paper, there is literally no reason why you shouldn't get a nine in the actual exam. If you want to know how many um, actual papers full, like questions one to five papers I did in order to get myself the grade nine in English language, I think I did about five. Five entire full papers. And then that guaranteed me the nine. And I was like some dumb kid. I was some Indian, like dumb kid. I can't even speak it properly now and I've still managed to get the grade nine. So it's, you're probably way smarter than me. So it probably would take you a little bit less, but seven is the maximum. If you reach seven practice papers and you haven't got the grade nine, or at least very close to the grade nine, you either A, haven't written enough, B, your, uh, your interpretations aren't perceptive or sophisticated or far-fetched enough, or C, you haven't justified or linked back to your initial point enough. This is the end of the four-step framework, and this just brings me on to my other random tips on the English subject. Hopefully now, if you want to just click off the video, you can, but this is, this, these are just some tips that I've, I probably would have found useful if I was watching this video right now. So the first one was, use ChatGPT to hack question five of paper one and paper two. So effectively, what you want to do is use ChatGPT as milk it as much as possible. And how I did it was in paper one, which is the fiction section of the English language paper, question five, which is like where you write a lot, or you write like a story or a description for AQA. What I did was, I was like, okay, I'm not that great of a writer. Like, I'm probably like a grade five writer. <laughs> I don't really read books that much. I think the last book I read was like Tom Gates or something. I, I, read, I read like self-improvement books, which kind of help with my nonfiction. But fiction, I don't really re read anything. So I, I thought to myself, okay, I'm, I'm a grade five writer. How can I use ChatGPT to milk out the marks for question five? And I found a technique that guaranteed myself 35 out of 40 every single time. And it goes like this. So effectively, what you want to do is make a very simple story. I did one about an old man who had a flashback to when he was at war and then he had a flash forward and then he just walked away. It's about moving on in like emotions and there's like PTSD and stuff. And what I used ChatGPT for was I was like, okay, write me a grade nine description of good weather. And I said, okay, use an extended metaphor, personification, lots of imagery and complex like punctuations, such as like semicolons or colons. And then I wrote down the good weather description and I muddled up, I like changed some of the words so it wasn't completely plagiarism. Then what I did was I did the same, but with a bad weather description. So both weather descriptions, one's good, one's bad. And effectively that was literally 75% of my entire question five. I literally just had a story. I, I literally had the good weather description at the beginning of the story. And then I filled in the plot myself with my shitty ass writing. And then I had the bad weather description, which was pretty chunky, which I, 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 I forgot to mention, I memorized both the night before. So I had my good weather description, my bad weather description. And because it was weather and because it was, it, it was all memorized, I got, I think, I don't know how much I got, but like in my mock, I got like 37 out of 40. And the only things that I had direct contribution for was the plot. Again, I'm not sure how much of this you should take, but I, I did like muddle up some of the words from ChatGPT. I didn't memorize all of it uh, verbatim, but I think this is a very good tip if, you, if you're if you not that great of a fiction writer, right? If you, if you could memorize 75% and get 25% of your GCSE, uh, like 100% in that, uh, I would take it, right? So effectively, again, just to summarize this, all I did was I went to ChatGPT, asked it to provide a description about good weather. You, you can do it about anything, literally just use ChatGPT and milk it as much as possible for English, especially because ChatGPT is honestly a better writer than any of us. And if you just use the skills it has and memorize some of it, change some of the words, you're gonna, you're gonna smash out question five of paper one. Now, question, uh, paper two, question five, again, that one's a bit hard. You can't really memorize stuff. You're given a topic. So what I did was I read like a few newspaper articles, uh, like three days before and I I practiced some complex terminology, but what I had in my brain was, okay, if I smash out questions one to four in both papers and then I smash out question five of paper one, if I lack a bit on paper two, question five, 
that will still get me the nine. That will still guarantee me the nine. And I think if you're anything like me and you're not that great of a writer, you can really maximize your responses and you can really maximize and practice your responses to question one to four. And you can let paper two, question five lack a bit if you want. This brings me on to my second tip, our second random tip, which is don't switch around to random sections of the paper. I think the YouTubers I told, I told you about, Mr. Salas and Mr. Everything English, they're really good. But there's one really key point that I disagreed with them on, which was like, they said, okay, don't do the paper in order. Don't do question one, two, three, four, five. Go to like question five, then do question four, then do question three, then do question one, then do two. Like, I think I tried this and I got a four. <laughs> I tried this and I got a four. That's one reason why I think you shouldn't do it. And secondly, like this just creates unnecessary stress. Like if you're do if you're doing a section that everyone else in the room isn't, it's going to create stress because you your timings are a bit muddled up compared to everyone else in the exam. So if I were you, like I'm speaking directly to my younger self, if I were you, I wouldn't swap around to sections to different sections in my GCSE English paper, and I would just do it chronologically because I think if you do do it chronologically, it just flows better and you just get more ideas. I don't know how to explain it, but it's just better if you do it questions one, two, three, and uh, three, uh, three, four, and five, instead of doing like question four, question three, question two, and then, you know, it's messing up your entire flow of how you write. Random tip number three, skim through the sources to get a gist of the source and don't read it like a book. I've seen so many people mess up their English grade because they, they take their, they take their, um, they take their English, they take their English language source and they read it like a book. Bro, this your future is online with this exam. Why are you why are you so relaxed in the exam? I've seen so many people who are just paging through their sources. You literally have like five minutes to read through like all of your sources if you have more than one. You should literally just skim through your source first time and then just skim through it again. To, and then the, the first time is to like kind of get an idea of what's happening in the text. And then the second time is just to like get ideas for what you write in your responses. Don't read through the source like a normal book. This isn't your grandma's house. This is an English exam. Please listen to me. Just skim through the sources. Don't read it like a book. Spend maximum five minutes reading the sources. Don't spend like 15, 20 minutes like everyone else and every, every other normie recommends. Because you're not, you're not aiming for a five, let's be honest. You're aiming for grade nine, and to do this, you need to skim through the sources. Random tip number four, timings. Um, the time you spend on every question is very, very important. Timing can really you over, and it has for a lot of people. So before your English exam, what you wanna do is write down the time you would finish every question instead of like, okay, we'll spend five minutes reading the source. Write down, okay, 9.05, finish reading the source. 9908 nine, finish question one like that instead of doing okay three minutes for question one five minutes for question five because in the actual exam you don't have time to calculate through the clock you just need to be thinking about english the entire exam and not falter and think about other things in the exam if you haven't watched through the entire video and you think you're just gonna go through go to this section and then get the summary this may work but to really milk out the content of this video, I would recommend going back and re-watching the sections of this video in depth and making notes on it. But a summary of this entire video is essentially this. You need four things to get a grade nine in English language. You need a good identity. You need to see yourself as an English language student. This mindset thing is so overlooked by every single school and everyone gets it wrong, but this is exactly how big level athletes or big level entrepreneurs get so successful is because they have the identity of a successful athlete in their brain first, and then they do the action. The second thing is learning new content. In English language, there is a lot of content, a lot of useless content online, and effectively what you need to do is waffle through that and sift through that and learn the content or the terminology that's gonna get you or get you the highest return on investment. And to do that, all you need to do is watch the videos that I've linked down below. It's by a guy named Mr. Everything English. He's really good. I think half the things he say, you don't really need to know, but like, it's good to know about. And that's that's the end of the learning content section. The third se uh, section of this framework is practicing content. Practicing is the thing that will guarantee you the grade nine. Practice using the framework that I've given in this video, which is you make a point, you uh, provide a, a basic interpretation of the point, and this is where you include terminology. You create a in-depth interpretation or a perceptive interpretation, and then you use this 
perceptive interpretation and link it back to the first point you made. This this is practically the perfect perfect paragraph for questions two, three, and four in GCSE English language. If you if you find a better paragraph, feel free to use that. But effectively, what you need to do is practice as much as possible. I think you should do seven, at least seven full papers to guarantee yourself a grade nine in English language. There's literally no getting around this. You just need to practice. I is the last step of the framework, which stands for intentional improvement. What you do here is pinpoint exactly where you want to improve in GCSE English language. And what you do, or how you do this is by using ChatGPT or the prompts provided in the link in the description or creating your own prompts or getting a feedback loop from your teacher and just improving on the points that they say and just really taking their advice. Don't like, don't think you're smarter than your teachers because you may be smarter than your teachers. I don't know how dumb your teachers are, but if they're English teachers, they're good at English. They, they've got employed for a reason, right? So take advice from your teachers, take advice from exactly where you've lost marks whilst writing your response. And these four things will guarantee you the grade nine. I have poured everything, my everything, my all into this guide. I've literally spent hours, I've spent like two, three weeks making this entire guide. So if you have learned anything from this guide, which I hope you have, and if you intend to implement this in your real life, the best thing you can do for me is just share this video or like and subscribe down below. If you wanna see more full guides like this one on different subjects in the GCSE spectrum, then I think I will be, I will be, making a lot of these videos but my channel is essentially centered around like self-development whilst being a student and i am an a-level student so i am gonna it's gonna be a bit hectic for me to make like full guides like these ones so as much as you subscribe i would i would like hold out or be patient a bit for my other full guides like these ones in each individual gcse um subject because they do take a long time to make my next full guide is on maths gcse so if you're struggling on maths definitely give that a watch if not, man, I'm tired. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you've enjoyed, enjoyed this video. Practice, hopefully you get the grade nine, and thanks for watching.